Michelle, and today we're going to be talking about rules of engagement. You can see my colors today are Ukraine's colors of blue and yellow, and I just think it's really important that you know all of us out there, if you know, if you're praying, if you're just even wearing something that just shows support for the Ukrainian people, please do that. These are very, very dark times, and I I appreciate that we have a president and a country that's practicing restraint because we do not want to be pulled into a war and have this be another Vietnam where we get involved in a third world war and something that we cannot easily get away from. And I think all the moms and parents out there, uh, my heart goes out to the young men that are on the front lines for both sides, the needless carnage and the amount of death that we're gonna see. I just know that Jesus weeps when he sees the things that are happening in this world today. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine without provocation, <clears throat> without justification, without necessity. This is a premeditated attack. Vladimir Putin has been planning this for months, as I've been, we've been saying all along. He moved more than 175,000 troops, military equipment and positions along the Ukrainian border. He moved blood supplies into position and built a field hospital, which uh, tells you all you need to know about his intentions all along. He rejected every good faith effort the United States and our allies and partners made to address our mutual security concerns through dialogue to avoid needless conflict and avert human suffering. For weeks, for weeks, we have been warning that this would happen. And now, it's unfolding largely as we predicted. The rules of engagement define directives issued by competent military authority, which specify the circumstances and limitations under which forces will initiate and or continue combat engagement with other forces encountered. In honor of National Women's History Month, we want to welcome veteran Ida Hawkins to TAP Talks. I certainly want to continue the conversations about the conflict that we have in Ukraine. If any of you joined us last week, you know that we had a guest to talk to us about some of the cultural nuances about the conflict. And so because we are now seeing a war unfold in front of us, I have our guest with us, Ida Hawkins, who is an army veteran that's gonna to talk to us about some of the things that we're seeing that we may not understand. And you know, I'd always have questions, questions, questions. So welcome to TAP Talks. And before we jump in, can you just give the audience a little background about your service history so they understand uh, that you understand? Okay. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for inviting me. This is like a sheer pleasure. When I was in the military, I would have been the last person to say that I was a soldier because I wasn't on the front lines. But there, were, there are, when we're in basic training, we learn the same basic principles about being in a war, being in a conflict and being a service member. So I was active duty army for five years. Um, I was in the, um, I was like a postal corps person. Um, I was stationed in Fairbanks, Alaska, and um, that's where I was. I was I elevated to the rank of, of uh, E4. Um, I would have been a sergeant. However, at the time, Desert Storm conflict came up. I was married at the time. My husband was active service in the Army, and... Um, they were going to divide our family and told us that we would have to send our children off to live with someone else while we went off to war for a year or possibly two. Um, that being the case, I was like, I was eligible to get out with an honorable discharge and I did because I was not, the thought of both of my children losing both of their parents was terrifying to me. I love my family and I loved his family, but they were my children and I wanted to raise them. So, <laughs> and I think that's good for people to understand that those are the type of sacrifices that people in the military are asked to make. 
Yes. I mean, yeah, basically God, country, yes. uh, family kind of comes secondary or third in there. And if you don't have a clear sense of what the priority is, absolutely. You say, hey, you know, we're going to both go to war and, and hopefully things work out and our kids will be OK. So I, I think all the moms out there, the parents out there certainly understand uh, yeah. that decision. If I hadn't been um, in a position where I was I was eligible for reenlistment, I wouldn't have had an option. Well, thank goodness you live in a country yes. where you have those options. We're seeing things now where people are being conscripted. They don't have Absolutely. that option. I mean, Absolutely. they were told this is what you're going to do. You know, yes. they, they don't go by codes of democracy or choice. No. And basically, I believe we were told from our guest last week that in Ukraine, if anyone age 18 to 60, that was a male, was conscripted and placed in the military. Absolutely. So that was involuntary service. So people yes. understand that. Yes. And that, you know, no one should have to do that involuntarily. You should, if you want to, but everybody's not equipped for that. Some people have other giftings that can be supportive of the military, but no one should be forced to go in if they're not ready, because that's where you get these people They get in and they don't know. And then they, they commit suicide and they have all we, where we see all these horrible things that happen to men and women, that, men that were um, drafted back in the Vietnam conflict and their, their mental health is horrible. You know, they, they just, because they didn't have proper mental health care and they were forced to do something that they didn't want to do. And then they had to go in and they killed women and they killed children. And there was no choice or option for them not to follow those orders or to be drafted. And that's a horrible place to be put in. Well, I think, thank you for sharing with us because we all know that there is a, a very dark history regarding the Vietnam War and some of our other wars, but I will agree with you that professional military is a lot different than being drafted and being told that you have Absolutely. to Absolutely. And I think that's why it's important for us to talk about what are those rules or engagement? Because when you are a professional soldier, yes. your behavior is gonna be a whole lot different than someone yes. who thinks, I just wanna go play guns yeah. you know, and go and shoot people. And then that's not really what we're talking about today. So, no. okay, we're, the show today, we're talking about rules of engagement. So the goal for tonight is for us to leave with a thorough understanding of what is fair in war and what is not. When you went into military training, yes, uh, when is that rule of engagement or fair play in war and combat, when is that introduced to someone that's in training. Okay, so the training for an officer and the training for uh, an unenlisted soldier are the same but different. Basic training is pretty much the same for everyone, but the educational piece for an officer and an, uh, an enlisted person um, or an unenlisted person is different because an unenlisted person does not have that command authority. So lieutenant and higher gets more of the rules of engagement training. Unenlisted personnel get more of the uniform code of military justice, which is what the rules are that you follow your chain. That's the first thing is you follow your chain of command. If your chain of command does not tell you that you are supposed to be active, have your, your weapon active, then your gun, your weapon should not even really be unholstered or off your shoulder because you are not supposed to be using that weapon randomly. Those orders have to come down from your chain of command. The highest chain of command in the United States is the, the, commanding, uh, the chief commanding officer, which is the president of the United States. Commands come down from there. But even as a foot soldier, you still have to follow the directives of your squad leader, your platoon leader, the officers in charge. You do not just disengage your weapon at any time when you randomly feel like it. Now, if you're in an active war situation and you have to make split second decisions based on 
your life or the life of some civilian personnel, then you will be able to discharge your weapon because you've been given direct orders to protect and defend. But other than that, your weapon should not be disengaged at any time. Like when we see um, things going on here in America where there are riots and things of that nature, most of the time the military personnel do not have their weapons in a position where they're going to fire them. They're strapped on their backs, they're holstered in their, they're holstered, but they are not active weapons and they should not be. Because if you see military personnel coming down the street and they're ready to fire their weapons, you need to get out of the way because you're going to get shot. Because they've been ordered. There's been they've been order given that. direct orders to, wow. in, to, to, that they can, in, they can disengage their weapons. Wow. So, yeah. But rules of engagement are something that are taught more to um, military officers. Um, you learn a little bit of it, and there are people that are not officers that learn, but in basic training, you learn the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which was established in 1950 by a congressional enactment, um, and it was to, to set a standard of procedures and criminal laws. So there are criminal laws that can be consequence of not following orders or disengaging your weapon without a direct order. There are criminal laws that a soldier has to, um, that can be charged with. That's why you have Leavenworth prison in um, Kansas. It is a military prison. It is for those people who have disobeyed orders, gone AWOL, um, and all kinds of other things. But one of the things that, one of the reasons they go there is if you have killed civilian personnel without an active order. Like you just went rogue on your own and decided that you couldn't trust these people and you were afraid and you shot them. They get court-martialed for that. So, wow. so yeah. I think hopefully the audience understands if you got some a idea that if you think you're going to go into the military just because you are trigger happy and you want to kill, shoot people, there's a place for you and it's called Leavenworth. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, in, in your comments, I, I want to thank you for that because I think it's important for the audience to understand that. So would you say one of the most important things you learned was that you follow orders? Yes. Yes. You follow the orders that you're given. And if you don't, there are all kinds of consequences. You can get put out. You can get a field grade court martial where you lose rank, you lose money, you know, all kinds of things happen, but there are consequences to your actions if you do not follow those orders as you're given. If you're in an active war zone and, you know, you might have to think on your feet, but if you can prove that this person gave an order that was in direct violation to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice is drilled into you in basic training. You test over it, you read over it. I mean, it's constant. For that six, eight, 12 week period, you learn something about the UCMJ every day. So you're accountable. But, yes, so you're you accountable are accountable for it. Yes, yeah, I didn't know that because they didn't know. You know that. And there's an expectation that mm -hmm. you follow that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there there are consequences. There are always consequences to your actions, but there are dire consequences to your actions when you're in the military. Okay, so now let's move on to, because I know we've talked about rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the Geneva Convention, because everybody talks about the Geneva Convention. Can you give us an, an important understanding of what that is, how that pertains to military personnel so that people get an understanding. But the purpose of the convention was to bring countries in agreement regarding um, immunity for capture and destruction of all establishments, um, the treatment of wounded and sick soldiers and their personnel. So it was to keep people safe. If you got captured by um, an enemy force. There were certain ways that you have to be treated. You're not supposed to be, everybody's not supposed to be tortured and, you know, just 
just tortured. No, everybody, that's not supposed to happen. And if there are consequences to countries that do that, um, there is a different treatment in combat and, you know, in between combatants that you just can't do. I want to begin by saying as simply as possible, the United States will support and advance international humanitarian law both as a matter of national policy and as a basic precept for the entire international community. We embrace the Geneva Conventions because it is the right thing to do. We embrace them because hard experience has taught us that we're safer and stronger when we do. And we embrace them because we honor the legal obligations we undertake. One of the other interesting things about the Geneva Convention was it was the recognition of the Red Cross symbol as a means of identifying persons and equipment covered by the agreement. So the Red Cross is like Switzerland. Hmm. Nobody's, supposed to, nobody's supposed to attack them. They are there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to treat the wounded. No matter what side the wounded come from, the Red Cross in a war in wartime, especially in World War I and World War II, um, but all the wars, but those two specifically, they were not to attack them as being from one side or the other. They were specifically there for the purpose of aiding the wounded. So, so they, um, they created a humanitarian component of war that said, look, we understand that there is a battle situation going on, but we also know that we have to have provisions for the people that are wounded. And yes. so you're not going to fire on or drop, you know, any kind of incendiary device on a Red Cross uh, outfit because you know that they're out of bounds. That's clearly out of bounds. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, like, I don't know if it's still true, but years ago in different foreign countries, you would see that big Red Cross on different hospitals. And that was the reason, because you were not supposed to bomb the hospitals. That wow. was that was neutral territory. If you saw that Red Cross on something, you were not supposed to bomb it. You were not supposed to go in it. You were supposed to let them treat the wounded. You could drop off wounded and they were to be treated by just neutrally by everybody. But the Red Cross zone was to be like a Switzerland. They are neutral. So yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Now we know that the U.S. is considered a superpower. Mm -hmm. And we own some of the most sophisticated weaponry known to man. And so when you start hearing things about rules of engagement and that war directives can only be issued by a competent military person, mm -hmm. what does that mean exactly? Because I think that's interesting that they said competent military person. From my understanding, Michelle, the competent military person, that is the President of the United States, who acts based on the military intelligence he's given and the advice he receives from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So it's not just one person that makes these decisions. The President and the Joint Chiefs of Staff have these conversations, they put together military strategy, and even at that, they can't declare war because those are a war is only enacted in the United States. We're only, we only are declared in war if Congress passes um, by a, I think it's more than an 85% vote. So it has to be an 85% vote of Congress that puts us into, that says that we're actively at war. Now, since um, I think it was, maybe the 1950s or the 1960s, we have done more to um, be more active as um, military force as opposed to war, which means that's when you have like the Green Berets, the Navy SEALs. If imposing military force is more sending in those teams for a specific pur purpose, sending them in, pulling them back out but it's not an act of war. We haven't declared 
war. Congress approved its last formal declaration of war during World War II. We haven't declared war, but we have enacted the use of military force. Um, I don't think during the Vietnam um, skirmish, during the Vietnam skirmish, that wasn't necessarily an enactment of, that wasn't an enactment of war. That was a show of military force that got completely out of hand. I don't think, you know, that's why Desert Storm was treated so differently. If you look at how we engaged, how we sent troops over there, it was totally different from what happened when we went into Vietnam. So, but we haven't, the United States has not declared war since World War II. Wow. So you can have, like you said, peacekeeping missions, meaning I'm sending someone into a region to keep mm -hmm. the peace. Mm -hmm. Or I could have a reconnaissance, like you said, that you're going in for a specific purpose and then you're coming out. Yep. So I think they, hopefully we learned that it's very easy to get into these uh, conflicts mm -hmm. and not have an exit strategy, not be able to get out. So you have yes. to know very clearly when you're going in what the purpose of going in is because you could get there and we know how long we were in Vietnam. It, it, it's right. been completely out of control and, and out of hand. And so I, at least I'm glad to know that we learned from that. And, I, and I'm glad. And I think that's why you're seeing probably so much hesitance right now to say we're not necessarily going to go and jump into every conflict that happens because we have to understand if you're going to go in, you got to go in and make something happen. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And that's, you know, and I know a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people, you know, not being upset, like, why aren't we doing something about Ukraine? For the United States to go get involved in a war, there are a lot of pieces that have to be considered. Yes, I want the Ukrainian people safe. I want them help to the best of their ability. But that's why we have so many soldiers at the borders where they can cross. But I mean, now the president of the Ukraine has asked for us to send in military personnel, but he hadn't asked for that before. And it is not the United States mission to go breaking into other countries that we've not been invited to. Now, I don't know since the, the president of Ukraine has, has asked for more military support I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know how that's going to transpire. But up until a few days ago, he had not asked us to come in. So that was the other piece that most people weren't aware of, that you can't just go barging into somebody's country. You know, then you become a part, you become a party to that war. And I think uh, Putin has certainly been clear that any involvement that he considers to be overstepping your bounds, he's going to consider that an act of war. And he's been very clear about Absolutely. that. I know there were discussions about creating a no-fly zone. And he said, if any other country wants to get involved to that level of degree, they consider that an act of war against them. So it's just been very, very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's one thing that I think we need to clear up because, you know, we were talking about the rules of engagement. Yes. That's only a, a concept for the United States. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That is not a concept for all countries. We have specific rules of engagement that the United States military is to follow. They're outlined, they're detailed. And the first step is the Joint Chiefs of Staff going to talk to the president and they have to outline these for these reasons, we want to engage these rules. And you don't always initiate all of them at the same time. You know, like, so maybe we just want to send Navy personnel. We just want to be a force on the water. So we want to surround somebody's perimeter with Navy, Naval forces. Maybe we want to send in the Marines, which is more of a ground, kind of joint ground air force. And how many of those personnel are we sending in? What equipment are we sending with them? You know, are we sending in army personnel? Are we sending in air force personnel? Or is air force personnel supporting 
the Navy? Are they supporting the Marine? So there's also, when you look at the rules of engagement, there are specific rules and they have to be adhered to, they have to be understood. And it is the Joint Chiefs of Staff's job to explain to the president why these rules of engagement need to be enacted in this specific situation. Wow. Thank you so much. Okay, what are some of the limitations when we okay. say that there's now been an act of war declared and you now have the person in charge that's basically calling the shots? What is just absolutely, is there anything that's just absolutely out of bounds? Well, what we're seeing right now in the Ukraine is absolutely out of bounds. But again, we can't just overstep our boundaries either because then that doesn't make us any better than Putin. If Putin crossed into their country and then we said we were crossing into their country because we were fighting him without, you know, coming in agreement with the Ukrainian government, then we're, we're in the same position as Russia. So the limitation is when you are making a threat and inhumane treatment of the nation's citizens. You saw it in Rwanda. You saw it, you know, in other skirmishes that have happened, other things that have happened. People are being mistreated. People are being murdered in the streets. They're being raped and pillaged and all these things. I mean, the Russians, from what we've seen, they're blowing up schools and hospitals. And, you know, people are just being massacred in the street because someone is having a power struggle. And this is why the UN is the first line of defense in all these skirmishes, because it is a joint, it's a coming together, it's a joining together of nations to try to resolve this without it going to a full-fledged war. And that's, you know, but these are the limitations. We're seeing the, the limitations, you know, because um, if the, like, was it a few, few years ago in Egypt, when the citizens of the nation overthrow the government, there's no military action taking place. Now, there may be uh, border patrols that protect borders of that nation so that those, um, those that are overthrowing the government, but if it is the citizens of a nation that are overthrowing their own government, you don't see any military action going on there. Everybody stands out of the way. It happened when, um, when uh, Germany toppled, when Russia toppled. Those were the citizens of the nation taking matters into their own hands. And so that, you know, that's a totally different, those, that's hands off. We can't touch that. We don't have anything to do with that. That is not another nation attacking, one nation attacking another. That is an internal civil war. And we don't have anything to do with that. And we've seen, and I think the President Biden's used the term, unprovoked attack mm -hmm. on a sovereign country. Yes. And Ukraine is a sovereign country. I don't think Putin wants to acknowledge or recognize that because right. I'm speaking back to the 17th century grandeur of Russia, but they are right. sovereign country. Does this violate the Geneva Convention? Yes, it does. Because back in 1989, after the former Soviet Union, the Russian Federation ratified its Supreme Council in 1985 and agreed to the Geneva Convention because prior to that, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics did not sign the Geneva Convention. But in 1989, Russia came, uh, the, um, the Russian Federation came in agreement and, and agreed to abide by the Geneva Convention. So yes, this is in violation of the Geneva Convention, which is why you're seeing the UN take such an active stance. And because the Geneva Convention, the UN United Nations was birthed out of the Geneva Convention in 19, of 1949. So that's why you see this enactment. 
Now, what's interesting is when I was reading about the Geneva Convention, you have all of these countries that have agreed to it, but there weren't any consequences, very specific consequences identified if you didn't follow it. So if you're a Russia or some other nation, you've decided, yeah, I'm going to sign this. Ultimately, they felt like, well, you know, there may not really be a consequence. <laughs> yeah, but that's why you this. see, that's why you see all of these sanctions going into place because being part of the Geneva Convention, being a member uh, represented in the United Nations, that's the unity of the group. That, that, that's one of the benefits that you can trade and do all of those things together without, um, without consequence. But once you, that's the biggest consequence that they have is we're hitting you in trade. You can't cross certain sea borders. You can't come outside your country and your country's boundaries. You are a lone wolf and you're all by yourself. So I know people don't think that sanctions are, you know, a lot of people want to see just force, but these sanctions are hitting home. You see these millionaires coming out now, the, the millionaires in Russia yeah. coming out and saying, you need to stop this because it's hitting them in their pockets. It him. might not be hitting Putin, but it's hitting his supporters in their pockets. And they're starting to say, okay, that's enough. You need to back off. Yeah, we're but losing that's, in the billions. Those are the consequences. They're more... Um, trade and financial consequences than anything. And you just, um, like, you don't have any support. If, you know, if your, if your people start starving because you've entered this skirmish, you're not going to see other nations coming to your rescue. I mean, once the leader probably is removed, then of course, other nations are going to go in and help the people because it's really not you know, we're not going to see people starving. But as long as that leader is causing all this chaos, then those are the things that happen is you don't have the support of the other nations. And when you don't have the support of the other nations, your, your house starts to topple. So now, we, now Putin has, of course, said that to his people that it's a peacekeeping mission. Mm -hmm. And we all know the propaganda machine in Russia has clearly defined that it's not really a war, uh, which we all know is not true. And I'm sure at some point his people uh, know that it's not true. But you're seeing this, again, show of force. They're talking about that the Ukrainian uh, military is outmanned by, I mean, just the ratios are just ridiculous. So, and then he sends this 40-mile convoy. We, we're seeing this convoy from Russia. This just overwhelming show of strength at some point that seems barbaric to me that you have a a ratio of i've got six or seven men to your one and yet mm -hmm. i'm still going to send in more people mm -hmm. isn't there some requirement that russia has to make sure that the citizens are able to get out of there because it seems like that's even been contentious no I mean, they should, but we already know that this person has no care of human life. So he should at least, but he's not going to, you know, that's, I guess, by his standard, some of the things that I read by his standard, the sitting at the border for all those days or weeks that he sat there and didn't cross the border, that was their, that was their warning. But we're talking about a person that is after one thing and one thing only, and that's power. He wants to usurp the power. And if he is able to do it in the Ukraine, there's not a whole lot that's going to stop him from trying to take other nations as well. Right. You know. We don't think the end game is just Ukraine. We think oh, of course it's not. Kind of the beginning. Yes. Of him returning the Soviet Union to its 17th century grand and we've seen a map of what that looks like. So yes. I hope the rest of those countries are watching because their turn is coming. Absolutely. That, that Absolutely. explains the 40-mile convoy. It's not, he doesn't need a 40-mile convoy, I don't think, just to yeah, take and see, and, But that was one of the things, too, was he's, to me, 
when I'm reading about this, he sent that 40 mile convoy because it was like a taunt to the other nations, to the United States, to France, to, to, to Britain. Um, and then, you know, all, that's why all the talk about airstrikes in airspace, because we could have blown that convoy off the map. But had we done so, we would have crossed into airspace and that would have given him an excuse an excuse to start firing nuclear weapons all over the world. And that's what he's looking for. Wow. He's a bully and bullies bully and bullies taunt because they want to engage. They pick on Ukraine, but his end game is the rest of the United Nations. It's the other superpowers. I want you to fight me. So I'm gonna go over here and pick on this little kid over here. So you come out and fight me. And then when you come out and fight me, I'm gonna cry wolf and tell, go tell the principal that you hit me, but I'm not gonna tell the principal what I did. But that's, he's a bully and that's what he wants. At least. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think he's, there have been some comparisons that what he's doing has been compared to the civil war that when, we had states in the United States that were trying to see that created a war. And he feels like, you know, really those territories really belonged <laughs> to right. Russia. And he's right. got this, this thing in his mind, I'm going to restore mm -hmm. the gym that I've now inherited. You know, Stalin didn't do it. Lenin didn't do it. You know, and he's, you know, memorialized in, right. in a tomb. I'm going to do what they didn't do. So you're yeah. absolutely right. There's just a real power element to him mm -hmm. trying to say, I'm going to do what they couldn't. Yes. So yes. do you, so do you look at those comparisons at all? I mean, you know, people say, Hey, the United States, you know, you dislocated all those indigenous people. You've had wars. You don't stand in a position of looking at us. What do you say about that? I say that might be some of the stuff that he uses as his justification. Um, but I'm not really one when it comes to things like that to, to do the whole comparison thing. Heinous crimes of usurping authority, yes. We have no record of murder, rape, plundering, theft of property. I mean, we do have theft of property, but treating humans as chattel um, in the Ukraine which is what happened in the Civil War, which is what was going on in the Civil War. Um, indigenous people were being run off of their land. Um, people of African descent were being raped and pillaged and treated as chattel. Um, I don't know that he might not do that if he was left to his own devices, but I don't think that, I can't right now compare the two, not to the Civil War, more and not even as much to Hitler. He's not after a specific, like his hate isn't directed toward a specific group of people. His is not a prejudice or a bias. His is he's is a, is an ego thing, where he can, like you said, bring restore back to the former Soviet Union the way it was in the 17th century, you know. And so that's what he's after. But he wow. doesn't have this all-out hate against one group of people like Hitler did or like we see um, racists have. Uh, we don't see the white supremacy. Does he like people of color? I don't know. I don't really think he cares. I think right now his wow. is an ego trip. Yeah, his, his power. power. His He's power. All Anybody that power. gets in the way. Anybody that gets in the way. Yeah. He's letting you know. And he doesn't care who it is. He doesn't, he doesn't care, care what, what you look like. You can be a man. You can be a woman. You could be black, white, purple, or green. He doesn't care. He's got, he's after a power, he's on a power trip and he's after that power. So. Wow. Excellent. Excellent um, information. Okay. Let's talk about Putin and his statement that he's going to put his people on high alert, i.e. his nuclear strike team. Mm -hmm. What would, ever make him think that this conflict would escalate to a nuclear war? Because he certainly he understands he's not going to be unscathed in a nuclear event. But that's what he's after. Because what he wants to engage, from my 
what I see, what he wants to engage is all the countries, but the biggest conflict he wants to see is between the United States and China. And if he can get those two fighting, this is straight up nuclear war. Yes. So that's why he keeps throwing that out there. That's why he keeps, I mean, China's already said this is all the United States fault. Okay. But China's mad at us. They've been mad at us for a few years now. So <laughs> there's a problem there. But um, that's what he wants. Because if he can get everybody else fighting. See, if the United States and China starts a war or at least um, engages in military force against each other, they're so focused on each other that that gives him the opportunity to go after those countries that he wants. Right. So, keep us but, keep us busy. Yeah. Keep yeah, us so, busy and keep us out of his his yard so that he can do what he needs to do and we need to focus on the conflict that he obviously. And I think you, you're absolutely right because I'm going to share a map here. It clearly shows the countries that have basically been neutral. They've said basically nothing. There are people that have basically supported him. And then you, you look at China because mm -hmm. of the enormous trade agreements that they have. If anything, they've tried to undermine some of the sanctions that have been imposed to say, well, you guys may do that, but we're not going to be a part of that. You right. know, so it's very interesting, their perception of the West as being an instigator in this mm -hmm. whole thing. It's just very, very fascinating. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you talked about uh, during the Ukraine conflict that we're seeing targeted schools, government buildings, bridges. Those clearly are supposed to be off bounds. I mean, he's even striking civilian areas. So how, how is this a peacekeeping mission? It's not. And that's what his people, when his people get factual news, that's what they're seeing. And that's what they're protesting against. Because, I, you know, I've read some things where people in Russia are protesting as much as they can, because, you know, he's trying to make it, you know, a socialist country again. So, but they're protesting from seeing the the schools and the bridges and, you know, all those, the orphanages blown up. They're protesting against that. They're like, this isn't when they can get factual news coming in. And right now he's got control of the news media. So, you know, what they're hearing is, really hearsay because it's coming from probably family and friends outside the country, but they're not getting factual news. Even there, I was talking to someone that I know and even they're even trying to scramble their internet access so that they can't, yeah, so that they can't get any factual information. So no, he has, he has violated all the precepts of the Geneva Convention and things that he has come into agreement with. I know I saw a, uh, and, and that's interesting, you're saying the internet, the role that it's playing in terms of getting information out, because you're seeing people post a lot of stories, whether that be on uh, just channels, anywhere where they can get media out. And you're seeing some very disturbing images coming out because they absolutely know, and he absolutely knows, yeah, I'm gonna have to scramble this because this narrative isn't fitting what I'm telling my people. And so right. the way I can control that is you're absolutely right to say, I'm not going to let you be able to go into any kind of social media and see what's actually happening, the children that are being killed, mm -hmm. uh, the elderly people that are being displaced. I mean, and you're, you're talking zero degree weather. Those are just horrific, horrific conditions. Absolutely. Uh, to be in. It's, it's just so inhumane. Well, you but know, because it's, it's just like um, the soldiers, the Russian soldiers that are fighting. They don't know that they're targeting a school or an orphanage. They're given coordinates. They're in a tank. They're given coordinates. They're told to fire. That's all they know. That's all they know. And it's the same with, you know, American soldiers or any others. They're not, they don't know specifically what they're firing at. They're following orders. They're given coordinates. They fire. Uh, if, if it's an, Unless you know the country or the terrain, you don't know what you're firing at. You just know that your chain of command has told you to fire at this spot. Now, you made an interesting comparison. We talked about Nazi Germany. 
we obviously know many of those commanders were tried for war crimes. The story that had a grim preface in the horror of Nazi concentration camps comes to an equally grim end in Israel, as Adolf Achmann is sentenced for his crimes against humanity. Defense attorney Robert Sebaceous will automatically appeal, but this is the end for Eichmann, who was seized in Buenos Aires in 1960 and spirited to Israel. The three judges started to study the evidence when the four-month trial ended in August and found Eichmann guilty on 15 counts of the indictment. In his bulletproof booth, Eichmann sits stoically as the charges are summed up. The unseen witnesses against this former Gestapo colonel are the six million Jews he is convicted of slaughtering. The judges then call on the defendant to stand as they pass their sentence. The end of a trail of blood and horror. The end of a man whose name will be written in infamy. The man who escaped the Nuremberg war trials by fleeing to South America receives justice at the hands of the people whom he had aimed to wipe out. think that that Putin understands that there's potential war crimes or do you think he'll be unscathed by this? I don't think Putin will. I think that if he is captured, he will be tried for war crimes. I don't know that they'd let him live, but if he does, then he would be tried for war crimes. But the difference between the Hitler regime and what's going on with Putin is they haven't been able to get as far in the Hitler regime, you had officers and enlisted people, and they were doing horrible things to people. They were cutting off fingers and toes and just leaving people lay there for dead and, you know, raping and pillaging. They stole art that is still being unearthed around the world. You know, so we haven't gotten to the place that Hitler and his armies were. But I can't say that it wouldn't happen. But right now, there's not as much of that one-on-one -on -one contact. You don't have as many soldiers on the ground in the Ukraine that are able to enact, to, to interact with the um, civilians. So I right now, I don't know how that would go. It would be based off of the factual information that's unearthed after this is over. Yeah, he probably thinks in his own mind he's just going to run a clean war so that he doesn't have to be accused of any war crimes, but it still goes Well, you know, because he's still in war. Russia. He's not He's not in the Ukraine. You're right. You're right. He's got other bl bloods on other people's hands. Yeah. Not he's just him. sitting up in his little ivory tower, sending, you know, dictating what needs to happen, but he's not getting his hands dirty. Not physically. Does he have any responsibility for the millions of people that'll be displaced and are going into Poland and some of these other areas? Because I don't know that they're gonna be safe there either because I don't think it's gonna stop at the Ukraine. If he's not stopped, if then it's not gonna stop at the Ukraine. If he is not, if this is not ended quickly and cleanly, then it's not gonna be over. Um, but Russia is going to have, once this is over, they're going to be charged, taxed for the displacement of these people and the restoration of the Ukraine. It's going to come out of Russian dollars. Although right now the Russian dollar is basically almost nothing at this point, it has zero value, but it's going to come out of their pockets as much as it can. And it's, it's just so logical, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna destroy the infrastructure, then I'm gonna take it back over and ultimately I'm gonna be responsible for rebuilding it. It's just absolutely illogical. I always give my guests the last word and I think what do you feel is an important takeaway for people in the audience to take away from our discussion tonight? Because your audience is mostly those of us that are Christians, those of us that believe the Bible, 
we have to hold on to our faith. We cannot let our faith fail. And Jesus told us in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, because in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we have to set aside our time daily to be in the word and to be in prayer and to be with God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if we don't hold on to that, and if we look at the circumstances of the world, then we are not following Christ. Because in Christ's era, it was the Romans. The Romans were taking over the world. We have to trust him, that no matter what it looks like, we have to hold on to our faith, and our faith cannot fail, that God will take care of us. He's already overcome the world. We gotta trust that. We can't worry about what we do or don't have. We have him. Our hope and our faith is in him. So be of good cheer. Christ has already overcome the world.